next step of model, which is also a very essential step for modeling, is the mode choice model. Now, in the mode choice model, you can apply three different methods. The first method is the revealed preference. In the revealed preference, these are the actual observations of the people who are using different modes of transport. These observations can help in estimating what is the existing demand and how this demand varies by the socio-economic group of the society. However, when we are trying to introduce a new mode, then the reveal preference service does not help. However, it is useful in knowing why people choose a certain mode and therefore identifying the control variables. The second method for estimating mode choice could be the stated preference survey. Here, we ask people what they will choose under the given set of alternatives. The problem with these kind of surveys is that the respondents can be biased. However, if we are able to account for the biases by the way we are preparing our survey method, we can actually forecast the impact of inclusion of new strategies or policies or development strategies. The third method could be where we go for an alternate scenario approach. Here, we first identify what are the plausible scenarios in the given context. Then we estimate what is the existing demand and what is the potential demand. Based on the potential demand, we define that if an alternate scenario is implemented, then what would be the changes in the uh, transportation demands for different modes. The problem over here is that the expected model shifts may be dependent on a literature review and therefore may not be representing what the people may actually choose. This can be accounted for if we are using a minimum shift and the maximum shift scenario. Such a method helps in exploring a what if. What if, if the things change? Then how the mode choice will change? Once we had collected data from the individuals using revealed preference and stated preference survey, we can actually estimate a mode choice model, which is basically a utility maximization model using logistic regression methods. The form of the model looks like what we are showing you over here. The numerator can be considered as the exponential of the utility of using of that particular mode. Now, I'll just take you through this example from Rajkot, where utility of bicycle is determined as being equal to minus 4.21, which is the constant, plus 3.52 if the person belongs to lower income group, plus 1.82 if the person belongs to the middle income group, plus 0 0.01 for the population density, and plus 0 0.07 multiplied by the distance being traveled. Minus 0 0.01 multiplied by accessibility, minus 0 0.04 multiplied by accident density. Now, this utility is in comparison to the private vehicles. What does that mean? That if, for example, population density increases by one unit in the city, then the utility of using bicycle will increase by 0 0.01 as compared to using a private vehicle. Now, these values can be converted into odds ratio, which is but the exponential of the different coefficients that are estimated using the logistic regression. So, for example, if I am looking at accident density as one of the variable, then exponential of minus 0 0.04 gives me a value of 0.96. What does that mean? It would mean that the probability of choosing bicycle is likely to decrease by 4% with one unit increase in the accident density. Such a model therefore helps me in identifying the control variables for encouraging the demand for bicycles and walking in the city. We are trying to estimate a mode choice model. Then 
we need to consider the impedance or the cost that people need to incur when they are traveling by that particular mode. However, the conventional used variables cannot be applied for active modes. One, for example, the speed does not vary and the travel cost is zero. So therefore, the impedance that is based on travel time and travel cost is not relevant for such studies. I am showing you how the travel speeds shall vary when infrastructure is improved. For example, if we are improving an infrastructure for walking and bicycling, then we can see over here that the speeds do not increase very much as compared to for cars. Therefore, impedance that is based on travel time will not reveal any benefit in terms of travel time saving for the bicycle, cycles and pedestrian. When we are considering impedance in mode choice model, we would need to consider other variables which can include, for example, measuring safety, security, comfort level, pavement quality, barriers that are there, number of attractions available, intersection density, crossing typology available. Now these list of variables is non-exhaustive. One may add based on the context and the demands that are observed through the surveys. Now I am going to discuss certain examples of modeling active modes. First of all, we will look at how different variables could be measured using specific indicators. Let's say safety can be measured by kernel density of crashes, security can be measured as street lights and root visibility, comfort level with the level of gradients, pavement quality as measured by pavement conditions, barriers measured by on-street parking, and number of attractions as street furnitures and amenities availability. Here I am showing you the example from New York study wherein the percentage change in walk share is observed with respect to the increase in the sidewalk. In the second example, which is coming from Vishakapatnam, I am looking at two different variables. One is measuring the built-up density and second is measuring the road density. So as the activity density in the city increases, the probability of using bicycling and walking will increase. Whereas an increase in road density in the city will result in reducing share of walking and bicycling in the city. Now I will discuss some more examples. The first example is from Delhi where the choice of walking to metro is more. Different variables including comfort level, infrastructure, safety, security and traffic are found to have significant impact on the choice of walking to metro. In this second example from Rajkot, we see that the choice of bicycling increases with increasing population density. The choice of walking and bicycling both reduces if the kernel density of accidents increase in that area. The second approach that one may want to explore is the stated preference approach. This approach helps us in knowing that if a new alternative is introduced or if an existing alternative is changed, then how will it impact the choices of the people? For the purpose, a combination of attributes that define alternate options are defined. Then an individual is asked to choose one of the combinations of the attributes. This is often called as a first preference choice task. The stated preference survey involves individuals making a mode choice in two alternate scenarios wherein different conditions based on travel time, efficiency, safety, comfort can be included. On the right hand side, you can see an example where in four different choice cards are developed with four variables. The four variables were fare, interchange, time on bus and walking time. The respondents are asked to rank these cards based on their preference of using 
a mode with a given choice set. In the case of Ludhiana, four different choice cards were introduced. The first card included the effect of providing independent lanes for buses, bicycles and walking. The choice card too included better transit policy in addition to what the card 1 was suggesting. Card 3 was including policy against cars in addition to the above. And card 4 was if IC engine is replaced with the electric vehicles. Now we can see over here how in alternative scenarios presented by the four cards, the mode choices vary. So the present mode, for example, is 11% people using cars, 39% people using two wheelers, and 18% people walk, uh, bicycling and 9% people walking. But when we introduce card 1, then we see an increase in bus usage, also an increase in usage of cars, but a reduction in the use of two wheelers. We also observed that more people are likely to choose bicycle. But in card 2, where better transit policy is introduced, along with independent lanes for buses, bicycles and walking, we observed that the car usage will increase. However, the two-wheeler usage will further reduce with an increase in bus usage. The use of bicycles may decline because the better transit policies are in place. When we are trying to convert these mode choice model and the demand, to estimate how different network is catering to the demand, then root assignment step is applied. Again, the problem with the root, conventional root assignment model is that it relies on the travel time speeds and travel costs. Again, the travel time and travel cost do not have any impact on the choice of walking and bicycling, particularly because travel cost is zero and travel time does not vary very much by provision of a better infrastructure. Therefore, when we are looking at route assignment for active modes, we need to consider other variables for modeling the route choice. The examples of alternate variables may include considering traffic volume, speeds, slopes, safety, availability of segregated infrastructure and lighting. So as discussed, if we are using conventional variables of root cost and root travel time, then we will not be able to appropriately model the demand for active modes. We need to consider the alternate variables which include the root attributes. Based on the root attributes, we can define the alternate root choices that are available to the individual. The choice of using the root by the individuals shall depend on the gender, age, income and other variables. Now this is the preference card that is prepared for root choice analysis. This is I am drawing example from Pune and here we can observe that two choice sets are introduced. The first choice set is about the type of route that is there which include the quality of the pavement, the gradient the crowdedness, particularly the presence of pedestrians and the uh, on-street parking availability. In this particular choice set, two variables are changed. That is the gradient and the pedestrians present on the road network. The respondents are asked to choose one of the choice card within the given set. In the second choice set, the built environment related variables are considered which include road widths, building density, land use mix, and informal sector employment. These choice set cards are presented to the respondents and they choose the preferable choice amongst the two choice cards. The data collected from there can help us in knowing how people are likely to make their own choice under alternate scenarios. This helped us in estimating a bicycle compatibility index, which basically had four factors, physical safety, social security, 
barriers and intersections. The physical safety related variables were having lesser frequency of buses, lower speed of motorized vehicles, lesser traffic volume and dedicated bicycle tracks. Social security related variables included formal land use functions, informal land use along the roadside, lighting availability and presence of other bicyclists and pedestrians on the road network. Barriers related variables included pedestrians on the road, on street parked vehicles, poor pavement quality and gradient. Intersection related variables included crossings signalized or unsignalized, roundabouts and uncontrolled motor vehicle entry and exit. All of these variables were then converted into a bicycle compatibility index and for every route or every road link that is digitized, such index is estimated, which is then therefore used for final estimating the demand on the different networks. Summary, we need to consider a modified four-step modeling approach when we are trying to model active modes. The first step should particularly help us in understanding what is the existing demand for active modes, who are the existing users. Then using a scenario-based analysis, we can estimate the demand for potential bicycles and walking in the future years. When we are trying to estimate the mode choice and the route choice and finally do a network assignment, we need to collect detailed data. This would include first preparing a route inventory, which would require us to map infrastructure, identify what new projects are coming in, define infrastructure by typology, and a care should be taken that all the links are digitized, including the local streets and the micro streets. For all the streets and all the links, the traffic volume and speed need to be recorded. Household surveys data should be collected. Emphasis should be laid on collecting appropriately socio-economic profiles of the individuals and the household, collecting data on bicycle ownership, and understanding travel behavior. In travel behavior surveys, the data on short distance trips should also be collected. We need to particularly take care of the zone size because as we had discussed that the larger zone size will result in missing out on the essential short distance trips. When we are trying to define smaller size zones, first we need to define or delineate the smaller size zones and for this alternate methods can be applied. Then for each zone, we should have built environment measures because built environment helps in determining the demand by the distance. When considering a trip distribution model, impedance matrix should be prepared. This impedance matrix should include delays, discomfort, travel time, and trip length distribution that has been observed in the city. For route assignment, as we had discussed, preparing a compatibility index for each kind of link can help in better estimating the demand on each link of the city. Overall, we have understood that modeling transportation demand for mechanized modes is different from modeling active modes. When we are modeling transportation demand for conventional modes, we should include active modes because if we are not including them, then we may not be able to identify relevant policies and, and infrastructure related development. Modeling active demand can also help us in identifying specific levers and control variables that can encourage users to use bicycling and walk in the city. However, when we are trying to model active de mobility demand, then we need to modify the conventional transportation demands. Such modifications may include, for example, using small size zones, using appropriate and relevant variables to consider the impedance imposed on the active mode users and digitizing and considering all of the road links 
for modeling the demand. The relevant variables may include measures of comfort level, safety, security, quality, traffic conditions, built environment, in intersection density, and accident or fatal crash densities. This is the list of reading material that one can refer. You can also reach me out on my given email ID. Thank you.